Hello everyone and welcome to Galveston College. Welcome to History 1302, United States History 2. This is the Summer 2, 2017 semester. I am your instructor this semester. My name is Scotty Lee Edler. Um, my office is M314. My office hours are by appointment Monday through Thursday. Um, remember Friday we are closed for um, the summer, but since this is an online class, I leave it the same. You can contact me Monday through Friday. We can get together or Saturday or even Sunday as far as I'm concerned. The office phone number is 409-944-1327. My um, secretary will answer that and take a message, but it is easier just to give me a call on my cell phone number. My cell phone number is 940-642-5219. My home number is mainly used for fax, but if for some reason you're not getting me on the office phone or the cell phone, you can call me there. It's an Alabama number. It's 251-408-9210. I currently live in Mobile, Alabama. So um, just keep that in mind if you have a, a plan with limited long distance. Please just do me a favor um, and do not call me after um, appropriate hours. I'd say about 10 o'clock p.m. Central Time. That's um, about the extent of what time I want to want to talk to you. Also, don't call me before about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. My email address is sedler at gc.edu. It's very important to remember that my last name is Edler, E-D-L-E-R. A lot of students will, for some reason, change it to Elder. Apparently, they don't like the way my, my last name is spelled. They decide to give me a new one. And it causes problems because if you send an email to s-e-l-d-e-r at gc.edu, it will not come to me and I do have a, a standard policy that if you send an email to the wrong email address, if you send it to S-E-L-D-E-R -E -E at gc.edu and I don't get your message, then um, whatever it was about, if it was asking for something or whatever and it goes past the deadline, I, I, don't, I don't count that. So please make sure that you are spelling my name um, correctly. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to kind of introduce myself and, and let you know um, some things about me, and then we'll get into the actual syllabus of the course. I was born in Wilmington, Delaware. I lived there for the first seven to ten years of my life, but I consider my hometown to be Lewis, Delaware. You can see it there on that little point, which is called Cape Henlopen. It is there right near, um, you can see where the Delaware Bay and the Atlantic Ocean meet. Lewis, Delaware is my hometown. It's also the oldest uh, town or city in the state of Delaware. They call it the first town in the first state. It was founded in June of 1631. Last time I checked, last time I, I updated the PowerPoints, it had a population just below 3,000. It was 27,000 people. Um, that's probably gone up. It goes up steadily every year or so. And the town is very small. It actually kind of reminds me a lot of Galveston, except I think Galveston's even bigger if you, if you count the entire island. It's only 4.3 square miles uh, of the town, and 3.7 miles of that is land. The rest is water. It's a very beautiful place. You can see from some of the scenery, the lighthouses, that thing down on the right is actually a fire control tower from our um, World War II Fort, Fort Miles, which protected the mouth of the Delaware Bay from German U-boats. The two lighthouses are the Harbor of Refuge Light. The white one is the Harbor of Refuge Light, and the brown one is the East End Lighthouse for the Delaware Breakwaters. They were places that ships would tie up after storms. So this is my hometown, far away from, from Galveston. Um, so, you know, when people ask why I don't have much of a Texas accent, that's, that's why. So my educational experience. After I graduated from high school, I went to Cape Henlopen High School in Lewis, Delaware. I went on to Delaware State University, where I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in History in May of 2003. My faculty advisor is a guy by the name of Dr. William Henry Flayhart III. He is a 
medieval and modern European uh, scholar. My senior capstone I wrote over a group of medieval Holy Roman emperors or German emperors by the name of the Hohenstaufen dynasty. I won the George Washington Leadership Award in my senior year, which is given to history and political science majors who show some kind of leadership ability on campus. And from 2003 until two, or 2002 until 2003, I was the chapter president of the Phi Alpha Theta History Honor Society on campus at Delaware State University. After I graduated in May 2003, I then went on to get my Master's of Arts in History at Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls, Texas. I graduated from there in May of 2006. My thesis director was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Dirk Lindemann. He was a German historian, German and Spanish historian. My thesis was the fall and exile of Wilhelm II, the last German Kaiser, a 21st century assessment. So my main area of expertise in history is Wilhelmine German uh, from 1871 until 1945, so the period that encompasses World War I and World War II. One of my secondary fields, though, is American Civil War and Reconstruction, um, so that is why I, I tend to teach History 1302 more than I teach History 1301, although I do teach History 1301 and Texas History at Galveston College online. I also, it says it's in progress, but I just finished. Um, I was working on 18 credits in political science at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, my thesis director is Dr. Gregory Petrow. Um, I have my 18 credits. I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to finish that master's. All I need is 18 credits to teach political science government courses at Galveston College. Um, so right now it's on hold, but I may re reassess that at a later point. Now my work experience. Um, my newest job is Southern New Hampshire University. I'm an, instru an adjunct instructor there. Um, I started there in April of 2016. Um, I have been at Galveston College since June 2011. I used to live in Galveston. Um, I taught on campus for years and then my wife graduated from medical school at UTMB and we were forced to move to Mobile, Alabama for her residency. She is an OBGYN and so we were forced to leave. So I continue to work there um, as an adjunct instructor online. I also have been at Navarro College since 2007. I did take a year off when we moved to Galveston and then they had me come back. Um, so I've been there for almost a decade now and before before I, I, I moved to Galveston I also taught at North Central Texas College as an adjunct instructor. Um, I taught on their Gainesville, Corinth, and their Bowie campuses from July 2007 until August 2010. Prior to that, I was a, a graduate assistant. And I taught discussion classes at Midwestern State University. Now, some of the classes I teach, now this is not a, a full um, list because I've got other classes I now teach at Southern New Hampshire, but I teach United States History One, United States History Two. I teach Western Civilization One and Western Civilization Two. I teach Texas history. Um, I teach World Civilization One and World Civilization Two. It's different. The difference between it and Western Civ is you throw in China and India and the Middle East. I also teach a upper level uh, junior senior World War One seminar. I also teach a World War Two seminar, a Russia Zardom seminar. And um, I also teach at Southern New Hampshire University every couple of semesters. I do teach the research methods course. So I do teach some graduate courses as well. I was the Galveston College Exceptional Service Award winner for adjunct faculty um, for 2012-2013. That was my last full year on campus at Galveston College and that's a picture of me um, with President Shelton on my right and my uh, award plaque.
And this is an award that is voted on by both the faculty, staff, and the students at Galveston College. This is just a, a sample of the different professional memberships that I'm in. I, I am a member of the Galveston, Galveston Historical Foundation, the Phi Alpha Theta National Honor Society in History, the American Historical Association, the Steamship Historical Society of America, the Community College Humanities Association, the Texas State Historical Association, the Lewis uh, Historical Society, the Delaware Historical Society, and the Texas Community College Teachers Association. Um, I'm also a member of a lot of different museum boards. Um, here in Mobile, I, I do some work with the Mobile Mardi Gras or Mobile, Mobile Carnival Museum. But these are the, the important academic uh, memberships that, that I hold. I always get a laugh at this um, e-card here, um, the guy asking a question and the professor saying the reason you get a syllabus at the beginning of the semester is avoid this conversation. It is sometimes distressing when um, students ask a bunch of questions and you realize that they've not read the syllabus or, or paid attention when the syllabus has gone over. So please pay close attention to what we're talking about here or if you're reading this. Um, you know, the, the actual syllabus document that, that corresponds to this video. Make sure you're reading it carefully and trying to understand it and ask questions if you're confused. But don't ask questions like, when is something due? Or um, what am I supposed to be doing this week? Because all of those particular items are addressed in the syllabus. And I'm going to tell you, essentially, um, consult your syllabus for um for clarification. So please make sure you, you print that syllabus out and you keep it with your materials. It is essentially the Bible for this course over the next four or five weeks. So um, get to know it extensively. Now what is History 1302 United States History 2? Well the catalog description of the course is that it is a survey of the political, social, economic, military, cultural, and intellectual history of the United States from the time period 1877 to the present. So anything after the Reconstruction period, which was essentially 1865 to 1877. Now these are the requ uh, required materials um, for the course. The first is American Stories, A History of the United States. I do usually recommend you buy the combined third edition. Um, this is simply because if you're taking both classes at Galveston College, it will save you money. Um, if you are not a Galveston College student and you're just taking History 1302 here, um, but not taking 1301, it's okay to buy, go online and get the second half of the book. That's okay with me. You can also get it other places. Uh, half Price Books usually has it. But the bookstore has a fine selection of copies of American Stories in the, in the um, bookstore. There's also a copy or two in the library if you need them. The author is H.W. Brands. He's a professor out of the University of Texas there in Austin. I've actually been a proofreader for this uh, textbook twice. Um, I proofread the first edition when they were moving up to the second edition. And I proofread this current edition, which is the third edition. They're getting ready to publish the fourth edition next spring. So um, that's a little heads up. If you have a copy of this, try to unload it as quickly as you can after the class so that you can get your money back. Because after the fourth edition comes out, you may not be able to sell it back. This is a very good book. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, is this a good book or it, are you going to use it? This is designed to supplement the lecture. It's not designed to replace it. I do have PowerPoint slides, but there are some chapters that I will ask you to read instead of a PowerPoint slide because the chapters are very, very good. Um, so you'll want to, to, to read carefully. The page numbers um, correspond. You should see them on the um, course outline. You will see page numbers. Make sure you're reading um, along with the, the PowerPoints. The second book you need is Prohibition, 13 Years That Changed America by Edward Baer. 
Um, this is a book that you will read in the first half of the course and take a small book test over. It should take you no more than about a week, week and a half to read this book, and you can get it in the Galveston College bookstore, but you can also find it online, and it should be very cheap. You should be able to find copies of it for less than $10. The special reader for the second half of the course, the second two and a half weeks, is Pete Seeger and the Power of Song. Um, by Alan M. Winkler. And again, you can get this at the Galveston College Bookstore, Half Price Books, online, Amazon.com, and it should be less than $10. You, you can get yourself a copy of it. And it's a pretty interesting book. It's a different book um, for a history class. A lot of times they're books on war or books on an event, and this is more on a movement, um, especially during the Vietnam era. So, it, it's a different change of pace. Some students like it, some don't. This is only the second year that we've used this book, but it's it's gotten some very good reviews, so I'm interested to see what you all think about it. Um, and like I said, you can get these copies of both of these readers fairly cheaply. Now, what is it that we want you guys to know when you get out of this course? Well, these three student learning outcomes are what we want you to know when you're done. Um, we're not arrogant enough or naive enough to think that you guys are all going to be history majors. The reality of it is the majority of you are not interested in history. You're taking it because it's a requirement. Um, I think that's sad because history is a very, very interesting topic, but I understand I took math once upon a time, hated math, thought it was boring, um, just did it to get through. So I understand, although, you know, I'd like to try to change your opinion on history. I realize it's probably a lost cause. We want you to be able to create an argument using historical evidence. We want you to be able to analyze and interpret primary and secondary sources, which we'll talk about when we get to the research paper instructions. And we want you to be able to analyze things such as the historical, social, political, economic, cultural, or and, and or global forces in U.S. history and how they pertained to the time period that we're studying, which is 1877 to present. Now, what are the course requirements? Well, first of all, this class is going to be taught by a series of online lectures like this um, through the textbook reading assignments and other learning materials such as special readings and, and things of that nature. Um, this course is entirely online. We will not meet ever um, unless we need to meet over Skype or something like that. We may never even see each other. The class will require more time than a traditional lecture class. A lot of students take these classes because, well, you don't have to meet in person, therefore it's going to be easier. Well, that's not entirely true. The trade-off on this is that you can work on the materials at your own pace um, as long as things are you know, in by the due date. But the reality of it is it's actually more work because what a lot of students don't realize is in-class instruction is usually about three hours a week. And then you spend another three to four hours a week working on homework, reading, studying your research paper. And instead of it being three hours in class, three hours outside of class, you spend about six to eight hours per week on your class overall. So when you think about it, you, it's about the same amount of work as a um, as a all a, as an in-person class. It's just that instead of it being an in-person class, you're never there and you do it all at home. So keep that in mind um, for those people who think, well, I'm just going to do it an hour a week and get away with that. Um, that's not going to to work well for you. You're going to need to be putting in four to six hours a week minimum, six to eight hours maximum. I'd say maximum. Um, with the research paper, it may be more. Just keep an eye on that. Make sure you're spending the amount of time because the biggest problem with students is that they, they don't give the course the respect that it deserves. They don't do the time. And then at the end of the at the end of the course, when they aren't happy with their grade, a lot of times the reason is because they just didn't put enough of time and effort into it. Now, first, there's going to be two exams in this course, a midterm and a final. 
And the exams are going to be multiple choice, true or false, matching, and or short answer. The exams are going to be located at the end of each learning unit. You're going to have two learning units, part one and part two. And these exams are going to be worth 40% of the overall course grade. So they are worth a, a large percentage of the grade. So it's important that you do well on them. Exams will be open for 24 hours. Um, usually it begins at 12 o'clock a.m. and ends at 11.59 p.m. So you get tw uh, 24 hours, one day, um, to access the test. After you access the test, you have a reasonable amount of time, about two hours, to take the test. So you don't get 24 hours to take the test. You get 24 hours to access the test. Um, you get two hours to take the uh, test. One thing I do want to mention, though, I had a student ask me this uh, last semester. They logged into the exam at 11 o'clock p.m. and then wanted two hours. The answer to that is no. If you choose to access the test after 10 o'clock p.m. on the day of the exam, every minute after 10 o'clock p.m. that you choose to access it late, you forfeit that time. So if you access it at 10.30 p.m., you get an hour and a half to take the, cor the course test instead of two hours. So please keep time in mind. These tests are designed to be done in about an hour, hour and a half, but I do give you a full two hours to take them just in case you need a little extra time. Now, if you miss the midterm exam, you can make that up with an excused absence at my discretion. Now, if you miss the midterm uh, or the final, you better have some kind of documented excused absence as to why you were not able to take it. I'm not going to let you take it simply because you forgot. Okay, that's what the syllabus is for. The dates are on there. Um, so please keep that in mind. But if you're in the hospital or you're sick or you have some kind of work related issue where your boss is willing to, uh, you know, give you some kind of documentation, I'm more than happy to make arrangements. And most of the time it's online, although sometimes we have to do that in the testing center there at the college. You're also required to write a research paper. Um, you're going to prepare for me a well-written term paper that deals with some topic that's presented over this time period. The research paper is worth 20% of the course grade. And in Canvas, you will see a folder that says research paper. And that will be where the instructions for the paper will be. You will also find a document called Guideline for Research Paper. And this is going to be how you write it. It's going to be how you cite your materials. All of that information is going to be there. So please keep that in mind. Research papers must be submitted through the Dropbox marked research paper by the deadline that we will present later on in the syllabus. No late research papers will be accepted for credit, period. Unless you have some kind of documented medical excuse, I will not take the research paper late. So once the deadline passes, it will be a zero for the research paper. So please take it seriously and please take the due date for it seriously um, as that is 20% of your grade. If you don't do the research paper and get hundreds on everything else, the highest grade you can get in the course is an 80B. So please keep that in mind. The most time consuming part of the course are the class assignments, and that's because they're designed to be done over the course of a week. Um, there will be weekly assignments, they're located in the learning unit, but since this is a five week course, what I do is I just open the entire unit up and let you work at your own pace. So unit one will be open immediately today, and there's multiple assignments for you to do, and then after the, mid, after the midterm's over, unit two will be opened and you can do those assignments. And most of the things in there are lectures that you must access and read or listen to. They're my lecture notes um, that I uploaded um, from my uh, uh, in-person traditional lecture courses. And the bulk of the information for the quizzes and exams will actually be found on my lectures. Um, the textbook reading that is next, you know, that's to supplement my learning materials, but the, it, it, the questions will be taken directly off the lectures. Um, 
the discussion board. There is a weekly discussion board that you must participate in. The topic is chosen by me, and I will ask a question, and you will answer it with one substantive post. And then you will give two responses to your classmates' substantive posts. So 33% of the credit will be for your post, and 66.6% .6 will be from your classmates' posts, the posts that, the, the post that you do on their posts. So if you do one good post, it's worth 33.3. Um, I have a lot of students that get confused or they just don't want to do three posts. They'll do a really awesome um, substantive post on their own and then they get upset when they only get a 33.3. Make sure you're doing no less than three substantive posts each week. And by the way, I do mean substantive. Um, don't say, quote, I agree or, quote, I disagree and, and think that that's going to count for your uh, post to your classmates. That's not going to cut it. This is a discussion. The, the post that you do should be furthering the discussion along, so please keep that in mind. Um, the class activities are worth 20% of your overall course grade. You know, not as big a deal as the um, exams but it is very important you do most of the coursework if not all the coursework because you earn a lot of valuable points that way and it's just an easy way to bank some points if you're not a good test taker other type of um, class assignments you'll have you may have a special reading this is a reading out of a journal or a newspaper or a magazine Sometimes it's out of American History Magazine or the Smithsonian or one of those that discusses some kind of historical figure or, or some kind of event. You'll read the assigned materials, then you'll answer a few short questions for credit. They should be typed in Microsoft Word and submitted through the appropriate Dropbox. You will find the questions that correspond to the special reading. At the end of the reading, there's a For Your Consideration section that is where you will find those readings in order to answer the question. So that's where you look for the, the, the question that corresponds. I can't remember if there's many special readings in 1302. There are for 1301. You'll also have a sometimes a historical document analysis and synopsis. And this is where you'll take a historical document. You will read it. And you will write a 50 to 100 word synopsis in your own words and submit it through the appropriate Dropbox. Now, what is a synopsis? That's a very good point. Um, this is one of those college level words. Um, best advice I can give you is look it up and, and, and let me know. Um, but that's a way I can tell that you actually did some kind of work. Look up what synopsis means if you don't know what it means. Scholarly articles and essays. You will have a scholarly article and essay that I will provide every now and then. This is the same as a historical document, but instead it's just an article or essay from a magazine. You'll read it. You'll write a 50 to 100 word synopsis on the, on the, on the article or essay and then drop it in the appropriate drop box. Very easy to do. All you got to do is read it and just give me the synopsis. Finally, you have um, quizzes. Every um, learning unit will have specific lectures, and there is a quiz that goes with the lectures. These quizzes are available in multiple choice, true or false, matching, and or short answer. They are um, usually 10 question quizzes, and you have 20 minutes to complete the quiz. Quizzes can only be taken one time for credit. Now, here's the thing. Most students don't realize this until they take the first exam. The quizzes give the exam their questions, word for word. So if you do well on the quizzes and you study the quizzes, you will do well on the midterm and the final exam. So keep that in mind while you're doing the materials. The last part of the course is book tests, and that will be those two readers. You'll take a, a test over prohibition and you'll take a test over um, Pete Seeger and I will put up a review sheet for you to look at it will be posted in canvas to help guide you through the reading 
And book tests are a combined 20% of the overall course grade. Each book is 10% of your course grade. And it's as simple as reading the book, answering the questions on the review sheet, and then answering the questions on the test. As long as you do that, you should be in good shape. And this is really just to te uh, tell whether or not you actually read the book. This is the uh, grade breakdown. We, we talked about all of this um, just a minute ago when we were talking about those different items in detail. But this is so that you can actually see it spelled out. The research paper is worth 20%, 200 points. The midterm and the final are both worth 200 points apiece, 20% each. Uh, the book tests are worth 10% apiece, 100 points each. And the class assignments are worth 200 points, 20% of the course. In order to get an A in the course, you must have 900 to 1,000 points. A B is 800 to 899. A C is 700 to 799. A D is 600 to 699, and an F is anything from 599 and below. And I tell my students to make a realistic goal and shoot for it. And if your realistic goal is a B, I will do every single thing within my power to help you achieve that goal. Um, any, you know, answering questions, putting up more videos or, or spontaneous lectures in order to help you out. But if you decide that your goal is an F and you're going to give me F quality work, well, then I, I will help you in that goal as well. So please keep that in mind and try to do your best in the course. I want everyone to do well. Um, so just make sure that you do the best possible job that you can. One of the questions I hear all the time um, from students is whether or not I give extra credit. Um, I don't tend to give a lot of extra credit, but when I do, you need to do it right away. Now, sometimes I'll say, okay, well, you know, you have 72 hours to do this, and if you get it in, it'll be extra credit. It's very rare. I don't do it often. Um, so that's why I want you to check in to the class. You don't have to do work every day, but I want you to check in at least every day and make sure that there's no extra credit assignments announced. And it's very rare. It's maybe one a semester or two a semester. So don't assume it's going to be every day or every couple of days. Now, do I curve grades? No. Overall course grades are not curved because success in this course is not measured by um, you against someone else. It's measured to you versus the material, okay? And that's what grade curves are. They measure your success versus someone else's success, and that's how you do on the test is no one else's business. It's just between you and the test. Um, now, that being said, if you end the course within a point or two of the next letter grade and you're eligible for the higher grade, meaning you have good attendance, you have good classroom participation, you've behaved yourself, you've been respectful, um, you know, you've put in the effort, I will bump you up to the next letter grade. So if you have an 88, I will, if, if you uh, meet all those criteria, I will give you an A. But if you have an 88 and you barely check in, you barely do work, um, you're rude, um, you're rude to classmates in discussion, you're rude to me, um, the, the curve of your overall course grade is not, it, it's not something that has to be done, it's not set in stone, there's nothing written that says I have to make an 88 or an 87 an A, an 88 or an 87 is legitimately a B, and it is well within my right to, to keep it a B. So um, that's another way of, of really encouraging you guys to get along with each other, get along with me in the discussions and other things, um, because I remember that at the end of the semester when it's time to, to give grade bumps. Now, if you have a grade dispute, if you think something's wrong, you think an exam is wrong or an assignment was, was graded wrong, like the arithmetic isn't right or there was an error in the answer key, that's fine. Let me know as soon as possible. If you believe that the assignment was miscalculated or something wrong, bring it to my attention within seven days after I return it. Um, I will then consider a grade change. 
If you do it after seven days, the original grade stands, no exceptions. Um, I can't have someone coming back to me four weeks, six weeks later and say, oh, by the way, I just noticed that this is wrong. I, I can't remember whether it was legitimately wrong on your part or not. Um, it could have very easily been that you changed it or something. So that's why I ask that you do it right away. I'm always happy to go over your work and check it. Um, but I just want to make sure that we're doing it in a reasonable amount of time. Special services. Now, if you're a student um, that falls under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, which is, of course, the federal anti-discrimination statute that prevents us from discriminating against the civil rights um, of people with disabilities, you can go to the Gal Galveston College Counseling Center or call them at 409-944-1223. And if you have some kind of documented um, disability, they can get you reasonable accommodations for those disabilities. If you have an ADA form that is not on file with Galveston College, do not present it to me present it to the Galveston College Counseling Center and they will decide what accommodations you need in uh, consultation with you and they will give it to me. Okay, please don't give it to me because I can only accept something from the Galveston College Counseling Center. Um, students, will, and by the way, you can't go back on that either. You can't take the first test and say, well, I'm just going to try to do it on my own and then come back to me afterwards and say, oh, by the way, I failed the first test. Here's my ADA accommodation form. My response is your accommodation form will start the moment I get it. So if you have an ADA accommodation form, get it to the college immediately, get them to send it to me immediately so that you can get your accommodations um, throughout the entire semester. And again, these are reasonable accommodations. Um, you can't ask for me to take the test for you or, or things of that nature. So um, just keep that in mind. And if the, any of you fall under this, please see one of the counselors, Janie Withers, or one of the other counselors down in the Galveston College Counseling Center, and they will be happy to get you taken care of um, in a timely manner. This is the course outline. Please pay close attention to all the dates on these slides and or the printed syllabus. These dates are set in stone and unless you have a documented emergency, this is the due dates for all assignments. First, we have the course orientation and information. This begins Monday, July 10th at 12 o'clock a.m. and it will go through Friday, July 14th at 1159 p.m. There will be this video along with a couple of other important pieces of information that you need to consult. And then before Friday at 11.59, you must complete two items to stay in the course. The first is a quiz over the course syllabus, these lectures and or the printed material. You must also do a discussion board introducing yourself to the class. Please note, if you want to stay in the course, you must do the course orientation and information. Students who do not do these two assignments will not see Learning Unit 1 open and at the time of the drop period will be removed from the course. So it is, it, it is very important that you go ahead and do this the very first thing when you log on starting on Monday today, if, if you're listening to it today, and finishing it by Friday. Now, Learning Unit 1, America to 1920, technically begins Monday, July 10th at 12 o'clock a.m., but in reality, it starts whenever you complete the course orientation and information section. So if you finish it on July 10th, you will then see it populate into Canvas that same day. If you don't finish it till Friday, July 14th, then that will be the day that you see it show up in Canvas. There are five series of lectures, The Gilded Age, Western Expansion, The Rise of Big Business, The Progressive and Populist Era, and American Expansion and World War I. 
each of these has a few assignments with it. Whether they be special readings, quizzes, or discussion boards. Please pay close attention to all assignments and their individual due dates. Now, almost all the assignments will be due for Unit 1 on Tuesday, July 25th, except for the discussion boards. The initial posts for the discussion boards are due on staggering days. This is to try and keep you active in the course, and so students just don't decide to get on Monday, July 24th and complete all their assignments in two days. So you need to be working steadily throughout the course. The first book test over Prohibition, 13 Years It Changed America, will be administered on Sunday, July 23rd. You will have 24 hours to take it. It will open at 12 o'clock a.m. Central Daylight Time, and it will close that same day at 11.59 p.m. Central Daylight Time. The same goes for the midterm exam. You will be allowed to take that on Tuesday, July 25th. It will open at midnight, 12 o'clock a.m. Central Daylight Time, and will close that same day at 11.59 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Unit 2, America from 1920 to Present, will open on Wednesday, July 26 at 12 o'clock a.m., and it will be available until Thursday, August 10th at 11.59 p.m. Please note that in order for Unit 2 to open, you must successfully take the midterm exam. You don't have to pass it, but you have to take it. Once you take it and submit it, Unit 2 will then populate into Canvas. There are five lectures, just like Unit 1, the 1920s and the Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II, post-war America, and modern America. Each of these lectures have corresponding assignments as well, just like Unit 1, including special readings, quizzes, discussion boards. Please, again, take note of the discussion board assignment due dates. Initial posts will be staggered. And in this course, I do not allow late work. On Monday, August 7th, the research paper is due. There will be more on that in a separate lecture. Also on Monday, August 7th, the final book test to everything there is a season, Pete Seeger and the Power of Song will be administered. It will open on Monday, August 7th at 12 o'clock a.m. Central Daylight Time and close Monday, August 7th at 11.59 p.m. Central Daylight Time. The final exam will be the last day of the class. This is Thursday, August 10th from 12 o'clock a.m. to 11.59 p.m. All right, so uh, the attendance policy for the course. Well, the college policy is that you're uh, expected to attend all lectures and that I'm supposed to keep an accurate record of your class attendance. Well, this is an online class, so that's a little difficult. Um, but the way I do it is simple. Any student that misses 10% of the total clock hours of instruction, in this course that means assignments because we're not face-to-face, -face, will be subject to administrative withdrawal, an AWN, meaning I have the right to drop you from the course. Now, also at my discretion, any student that's tardy, which again, this doesn't really respond to you guys because this is an online class, but tardiness may also be treated the same as an absence. But the way I do it's simple. You know, if you stop coming then I don't necessarily drop you. It says I can drop you, but I don't drop you. The reason why is simple. Too many students quit coming. They get upset when I drop them. The college puts them back in the course, and they never show back up again. If you want to drop the course, go to the registrar's admissions office, get a drop slip, and drop the course yourself. Don't expect me to drop you by just not coming. Um, that's just not acceptable you should be um, keeping an eye on your, your class. Remember, you're paying for this, 
and you don't get money back if you end up failing because you stopped coming. If you decide to drop the course because it's not a class you want to take, the nice thing is, is you might be able to get some of your money back. Um, and also an F on your transcript because you just didn't finish showing up is not a good thing to have. So keep that in mind. Um, I am willing to work with you, though, if you disappear for a while and you come back and you've got a good excuse as to where you've been. I'm always happy to work with you and, and get things done. But, you know, you should be checking into the course every day or every other day just so that we know that you're active and, and doing stuff. So, so please just make sure that you're active somehow, at least on the discussion board, at least signing in. That way we know that you're still alive and, and still uh, working in the course. Now, academic integrity is something that I personally take very seriously. And as a college student, you are supposed to follow a certain code of conduct. And essentially, it is your responsibility to maintain scholastic integrity. When you're doing a writing assignment, you are required to give full credit to the author that you got the information from. If you don't, this is called plagiarism. You are also not supposed to copy and paste someone else's discussion board. Um, those type of things are unacceptable in a college classroom. And if you do something like that, we can refer you um, to the college administration. And some of the different punishments are loss of credit for the assignment, for the exam, if it's an exam, for the entire unit of work, failure in the course, or dismissal from the college. And the way I handle this is simple. If it is um, plagiarism or cheating, but it is... You know something that's questionable like you didn't know that what you were doing was wrong or it was minor infraction I usually keep it as a teachable moment and I uh, pull you aside and we discuss it we straighten it out and you don't do it again if it's something blatant like you buy a paper online or you copy and paste um, your term paper from Wikipedia don't laugh, it's happened more times than I really want to admit. Um, I will give you an F on the assignment. And if it's really blatant, I'll give you an F in the entire course. So please keep that in mind. Please keep to the student code of conduct, which is in the Galveston College Handbook. Um, and let's just say this is important. Students don't realize this, that you can actually get dismissed from the college. Any of my Aggies out there who are taking um, this course um, at Galveston College, but you, you do most of your coursework at um, Texas A&M University or Texas A&M University Galveston, my question is how does Texas uh, A&M handle cheating on their campus? Um, much stricter than pulling you aside the first time and, and having a heart-to-heart it's it's a very serious offense in most colleges and universities so please take it seriously if you have a question about what you're writing in your research paper if you think you're not quoting enough or citing enough get a hold of me and we can look at it together and we can try to work it where you're not um in danger of plagiarizing and sometimes it's as simple as that sometimes you don't know how much to cite or how little to cite we can work on that together. So don't be afraid to contact me about that in person if you need to. Now this is one of those slides that I normally use in my traditional in-person um, or in-class class. But since this is an online class, there's no real provision against cell phone use. I mean, look, let's be honest. I've got my cell phone sitting here right next to me while I'm recording these lectures for you tonight or I guess it's 1.30 in the morning, so it's this morning, Monday, July 11th. Um, here's the deal, though. The only cell phone, smartphone rule that I have is that you must use a desktop or a laptop computer for the course. There are many functions and features within Canvas that do not work on cell phones and tablets. Never, ever, ever try and take a quiz or exam with a cell phone or a tablet. You must always use your desktop or your laptop. 
If you don't have a desktop, you don't have a laptop, or you don't have access to a desktop or a laptop, then you either shouldn't be in an online course or you should be going to the computer lab every day at Galveston College during their normal business hours and using their computer. Part of taking an online course is it's assumed that you have access um, to a, a computer. Make sure you do so, okay? Because that's the only way you can do well in this course is having some kind of access. And you don't have to own the computer. That's not what I'm saying. You can access it through the library, Galveston College Library, the library in Galveston, okay, the Rosenberg Library, um, or wherever you're located. Maybe you're not in Galveston like me. There, there are plenty of ways to get access to a computer, but please do not try to take a quiz or exam with a cell phone or tablet. It won't let you submit most of the time, and many of the text boxes will be missing. And if you hit submit afterwards, the grade will stand. You can't come back to me later on and say, well, I tried to take the quiz or exam with my cell phone, and it wouldn't work, and so I shut it down to restart it, and now it won't let me in. I'm going to tell you I'm sorry, but I've warned you before not to do that. The grade will stand. So please make sure you're using a regular computer for your coursework. I don't mind if you read something on your cell phone, you know, like maybe one of the special readings or something. Although, why would you want to read on your cell phone? They're so small screens. You've got these big computer screens now. But, you know, it's very important for quizzes and exams to not use your cell phone or your tablet. Now, as I said before, we do provide computer resources for the purpose of accomplishing tasks that are essentially related to the mission of the college. So you are allowed to use our computer resources for school-related um, things, such as checking email, doing assignments, things like that. But you are not allowed to do other things like download music or other unseemly things that people do at times. If you have a question over whether or not what you're doing violates our college computer policy, please consult our Galveston College catalog or the student handbook for clarification. The course syllabus, including this video and the documents provided in Canvas, are constantly being looked at and will be revised until Monday, July 10th, 2017, which should be the beginning of the course. After that, there should be no need for change in the syllabus. That being said, if there is a mistake found after July 10th, an announcement will be made and the syllabus will be revised. That being said, that's very rare that we do something like that that would be for some major error like a date issue so for all intents and purposes this course syllabus is final now late work what are you allowed to do what are you allowed to hand in late or 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 have a chance to do after the deadline well first the midterm exam and the book test well if you miss the midterm or the book test, you must request a makeup exam within two days. Days are defined as calendar days, not school days. If you miss the midterm exam or the book test, you will receive an email in Canvas from me specifying the deadline for the makeup request. They can be in any format that I want. They will be longer than the original exam. And most of the time they're administered in the Galveston College Testing Center. I'm not going to give you the same test uh, that you didn't take online because the chance someone may have told you what's on the exam, and that's not fair um, that someone would, would give you a, an advantage that other people did not have. So you will have a different version of the exam. Also, it's to give you some incentive to take the exam or the book test on the date scheduled, knowing that the exam may be much larger and maybe harder maybe it's going to be all all essay will keep you from taking the easy way out and saying ah i didn't study for it i'll just go ahead and take it in two or three days down in the testing center now um, it will be different and it will be 
possibly a little bit lengthier. It's not going to be harder. It'll be the same material. It just may be, instead of it multiple choice, true or false, it may be an essay test. Students who miss the deadline for the makeup will earn a zero unless you notify me earlier of some kind of extenuating circumstance or you have some kind of um, medical excuse. Now, there is no final exam makeup because the final exam is given on the final day. If you miss the final exam, you get a grade of zero for the exam unless you obtain permission from me earlier than the exam and you take a grade of an I and incomplete. Now, this is something that has to be a legitimate reason for taking a, a, a um, incomplete. You can't just take it because you forgot. Okay, it has to be something serious, like a major car accident, or um, your wife went into labor, or if you're a woman, you went into labor or something. Um, and it must be documented so that we have it on file. And this is a very hard thing to get done, by the way, too. Not only do I have to grant you the incomplete, then I have to pass it by my boss, Dr. Blumstead, the department chair for history and government. He has to sign off on it. Then I have to get the uh, division director, uh, Professor Waddell, the director of the Division of Arts, to sign off on it. And then we have to get Dr. Matthews, who's the vice president of academic affairs, to sign off on it. So this is a very difficult process, and we use it very sparingly. Class assignments. There are no makeups on class assignments. If you miss the deadline, it's a zero. Research papers, same thing. No late papers will be accepted for credit. Galveston College takes student success very seriously. And for that purpose, Galveston College does provide tutoring for our students free of charge at the Student Success Center. If you are interested in this service, please visit the Student Success Center or you can go to the website provided below on this slide and we are happy to um, get you the help that you need. Also, let me know if they don't have any tutors for History 1301 or History 1302, and I may be able to give them um, names of people who can, who can come and help out. But please use the resource. If you think you need tutoring, please use the resource. It's there for you, and it is free. So we are happy for you to use it. Instructor contact policy. How do you get a hold of me? Well, I'm available to each of you by email, okay? Um, email is sedler at gc.edu. It's at the front of this and also on the course syllabus. I'm also available to you in the course questions and help discussion board. If you have a question that maybe the entire class might have, you can post it there and I'll answer. You can get a hold of me by telephone and also by other forms of electronic communication. If you email me, you must do so at my sedler at gc.eu email address. And I will have up to 24 hours to respond on regular days and 48 hours on weekends. Um, this is because I just can't physically be attached to my email for that entire time. Usually it's not that big of a deal. Usually I reply pretty quickly um, within an hour or two, but don't get panicky if it's been 12 hours and I haven't responded to you, or it's been 20 hours on a weekend, you know, I have to take some time off as well. So also you are required to use either the Canvas email system or your Galveston College email assist, uh, system. Do not email me from another college email or from a personal email address. I will not respond. This is because the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, um, is designed to protect your privacy. And if you're contacting me using your personal email, that's fine, but I don't know who has access to that email. And it might be something that is confidential, like you're talking about a grade or an absence or um, some other issue. And what if you share an email address with your husband or your boyfriend or whatever? That person could have access to your email address and be able to read your emails. Your emails are between you and me. 
nobody else, not your parents, not your spouse, not your cat, not your dog. They're between you and me. If you cho choose to share them, that's fine, but it has to be through the Galveston College or the Canvas email system so that I know that it's safe and secure. Um, and also, let's be honest, you know, how many people have strange email addresses out there and your name is John Smith, but your email address is hottie420 at AOL.com. Well, I don't know who that is. I know who John Smith is. He's on my roster. But, you know, whoever this guy is, you know, the email address, I don't know who it is. So it's very important you use your Galveston College or your Canvas email um, so that I know who I'm sending the emails to. And by the way, when I send you emails, the only emails I will send you are to those email addresses. So if I do a class announcement and copy it as an email to every student, it'll go there. It's not going to necessarily go to your personal account. Telephone calls are always welcome between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. I said even 10 p.m. if you're if you need to. But a couple of things. First of all, don't call me in the middle of the night. Um, don't call me super early in the morning, like 6 a.m. My wife is, an, is a doctor. She works strange shift work, and sometimes she's working night shift, and she comes home at 7 o'clock, and she's got to have an hour to unwind before she can get into bed. Once she's asleep, it's no big deal. Um, and also, the fact of the matter is I don't like to get up early, and I don't like to stay up too, too late. I'm usually up about 1, 2 o'clock, but if she's home and on a day shift, I don't want a bunch of people calling and waking her up um, when it's quiet time, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. If you call me and I'm not available, please leave a message either on my home or cellular voicemail and I will return your call as quickly as possible. Now, please remember that I do not return hang up calls, um, especially for those people who have cell phone numbers that may come up unlisted. So if it's important enough for you to call me, it's important enough for you to leave me a message. I promise you right now, I will not return a call that does not have some kind of voice message. It could be a telemarketer calling me. It could be just someone I don't want to talk to. Um, I need to know who I'm calling. And also, it's just great for me to be able to know who I'm calling so that, A, I'm not having to ask for, hey, who are you? Why would you call me? And B, that way I can have all your information in front of me so that we're not wasting time. I can get right down to business for you. If you want to meet face-to-face -face with me, I'm perfectly happy to do that. We can uh, contact each other digitally through Skype by appointment. I do this a lot with students who want to see me and talk to me. We also can do Google. We can do a group through Google Connect um, where I can even set up a whiteboard and we can uh, – talk and you guys can take notes and ask questions so that's also available for you if you if you want to use it so i'm pretty open pretty reasonable with getting a hold of people um pretty quick to get back to them um so if you need something please don't hesitate to contact me i'm here i want to help you so just get a hold of me and we can get things get things straightened out if you email this or or if you email or call the secretary I can't guarantee the 24 to 48 hour uh, turnaround because I can't guarantee that she's going to give me the message um, quickly. So that's why I would prefer instead of you calling the office and leaving a message with Joanne, I'd rather you just call me directly. Finally, a note on correspondence and writing assignments. All writing assignments and correspondence email um, with me should be written in legitimate English. You guys are all in college, so it's assumed that you're going to be college-educated people. You are expected to be able to write with correct English, and I do impose this requirement as a way for you to practice your skills. Also, when you write me an email, make sure you put the course ID number and the section number in the subject heading so that I know what class you're in. I teach multiple classes at multiple times at multiple schools, and it's great to know which folder to open up on my computer to look up your information, look up your grades. And so for this course, in the subject heading, you would put somewhere in there, History 1302, 
3115. So make sure that's in there um, anywhere you, you put it. Symbols and letter combinations such as UR for your, B slash C for because, W slash for with, or W slash O for without. Look, they're fine for sending text messages. I'll be honest with you. B slash C and W slash are two of my favorites when I'm writing a text message. But for assignments and correspondence in a college class, they're unacceptable. Okay. Really, the only acceptable abbreviations in this class are ones like the U.S. for United States or U.K. for United Kingdom. Okay. And a lot of students, by the way, send me text messages. I do not like text messages. Please do not send me a text message. No offense. Um, I consider text messages to be a form of communication between you and your friends or me and my friends. Um, I'm your course instructor. I'm not your friend. Um, I'd like to be your friend, maybe, but after the course is over. Um, seriously, though, I just don't like them because I have fat fingers and I don't like to type, to be honest with you. And also, it's just really not appropriate. I'd rather have an email so that I have some documentation, and that way we can go back and forth in a reasonable way. And it's very hard to write, especially if I have something that's really got to be written long. It's hard to do that in a text message conversation. So please, you don't have to send me a text message. Um, if you do use text message spelling or inappropriate abbreviations in a class assignment, I do take off two points each time you do it. So be careful, okay? Don't use text message spelling, okay? Well, that's it. Um, I look forward to getting to know each of you over the next five weeks. Um, I get I look forward to seeing what you guys have to say in the discussions and things like that. If you have any questions, any concerns, please get a hold of me at sedler at gc.edu or give me a quick call. I've already heard from some of you, you know, it was a requirement to uh, contact me before the um, semester began. And I probably have heard from about half of you. So make sure you check in by email and say hello and let me know what's going on. Make sure that you've got your books and everything. And if you have any questions for me, um, please feel free to get a hold of me. Start going through the material right away. And um, that's about it. Okay, well, uh, it's pretty late. It's almost 2 a.m. here in Mobile, Alabama. So I think I'm going to uh, hit, hit the bed. But if you need anything, please get a hold of me, and I'll be happy to get back with you tomorrow morning.